John chapter 3. We are going to talk about Nicodemo. And uh, so then, um, let's see. Let me go over this one second here. This. All right, so no, no college classes on Monday. Next, a week from today, we have another lecture, and then there's preaching conference, which there is no, excuse me, there are no, actually, there are classes on Monday, aren't, aren't there? Yes, yes, but it's the... Um, it's the afternoon. Thursday and Friday afternoon classes. Yeah, okay, All right. And so there's no, n not this class. And then we have one more lecture on the 1st of May. And then I've got something there that says in-class project. You might want to wonder what that is, but I'm going to leave you in the shroud of mystery. And then you have a paper due the week after that. We'll review through the, for the final. That will likely be a very short day, as long as you can hear what I'm saying because you're too far away. And then the final exam schedule should be out. So that's it right here. So this, there are only three more lectures, of which this is one. After this, we will have completed 33% of what is left. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your love for us. Lord, I ask that you bless us and you help us to go through the scriptures in such a way where we've got a good handle on your word, that we're putting things together, that we can think through what it, sa what it says based on what the rest of the Bible says. And as uh, this, in this incredible discourse with Nicodemus, probably one of the sources of, uh, of salvation for many people. I remember my mom got saved from, from this passage of Scripture. And so, Lord, it is a very clear presentation of the gospel here but in such a way where Old Testament is brought into play and we have a better understanding of the link between the Old and the New Testament, or uh, the New Testament with the Old Testament as a result of your discourse here. So, Lord, we're thankful for that. And now as we study it, I pray that you give wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, the first thing we're going to look at then is an introduction to this. We're going to look at some of the things that happen. And as is our habit, we'll look through... Um, some of the things that happened before, and see what leads up to this discourse. All right. Um, so, meet Nicodemus, or Jesus meets Nicodemus, or Nicodemus, however you want to title it that way. <clears throat> okay, so, let's jump back up there. If you're in John chapter 3, let's go to chapter 2 and see what happens. Okay, th th what we see then uh, is that the, the Lord was at a wedding feast of Cana. We see that in verses 1 through 11. And then it says in verse 12, And after this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. <clears throat> and the Jews' Passover was at hand. Okay, what is the Passover? What does that commemorate? It is, it is a memorial. Um, it's a memorial feast for the Jews, but what does it commemorate? Cannot, you have, can't be lazy of mind, Joy. You have to be sharp as a tack. Jacob, the it's not working. The yeah, the death angel. That's right, yeah, the tenth plague. Very good. So we know then that it was important, well, we see then, that it was important for the Lord, to, for the nation of Israel to remember uh, the Passover um, and the death of the firstborn. For what reasons then that would the Lord want his, the nation to remember that? For what reasons? We're opening up the discussion because I'm trying to get you to have more than one collective brain cell this morning. Like you're sharing one, it's somewhere in the room. Yes? Well, um, you would want them to remember deliverance. Okay. <clears throat> from? From, well, both from the death angel and also it was one of the plagues that often had used. And it was the last plague. Okay. Um, what, what was associated with this? What was going on? Let's go back to Exodus. Okay, we're going we're gonna to go back 2,000 years. Here we are, that fateful night. What's going on there? Uh, they had to kill a lamb and put a spot on the doors. Okay, yeah, on the doorposts, okay. And if they saw, if the death angel which came, which I think that was mentioned, saw the blood, it would pass over that home. All right. That then is a clear, uh, at least to me and I think to most, a clear, uh, present, I'd say presentation, but a picture certainly of Christ, isn't it? So when we, it's not an appearance of Christ necessarily, but it symbolizes what Christ did. He shed his blood. So the blood there was important, wasn't it? 
it didn't, it didn't say, it wasn't just the death of the lamb. It was the death of the lamb and its blood. So it was both. And so that puts a, a, an importance and a prominence on the blood, which I don't suppose that to a Jewish person that was too much of a problem. All you would have to do is look at the brazen altar, which was filled with blood, uh, animal blood, to know that there must be some significance there. And so that, that uh, so it was their deliverance. It was their deliverance from bo physical bondage and, of course, that sacrificial system, which um, was from the days of Adam, when those animals were slain. We know that Abraham sacrificed, right? We know that because he was going to sacrifice his son on the altar that wasn't unfamiliar to them. We know that Noah sacrificed. What's the first thing he did when he got out of the ark? He sacrificed. Why did, the, did they do that? These people did that in a time where there wasn't a temple and there wasn't a tabernacle and the Lord hadn't given that law to Moses yet. And yet they sacrificed because they had an understanding, and there has always been an understanding from the very first man and woman, that fact, uh, sacrifice was necessary in order to be right with God, to reestablish that union. So they knew that. So the gospel message has always been around throughout history and throughout time. And so what we preach and teach is essentially the same thing. We simply point to who we know to be the Savior, and they were pointing forward to who they knew would be the Savior. Other than that, it's the same thing. So this is the time that the Jews were commemorating the Passover. It had become much more of a ceremonial um, event as opposed to what it symbolized. It became an activity, okay? That's easy to do, isn't it? Church can become an activity and not necessarily a, way, a means of being better with the Lord or contributing. It's just we show up. I find myself that way. Thursday evening, I show up at church. My body just kind of shows up because I'm, I'm naturally, I just I end up here, okay? I don't have to force myself. I'm just here. And I'm sure that's the way with all of you, which isn't necessarily a bad habit, but it can't just be there. So probably a lot of the Jews, and I'm getting there with Nicodemus, probably a lot of Jews were there, and they were simply there because it, it was their tradition. There were three feasts in which the Jews were to uh, visit the temple. Uh, if they were uh, male, the men at least. And Passover was one of them. The first fruits was another one, and then Pentecost was the third one. So those three um, um, feasts, it was not, now there were other feasts, in fact there were seven, but those three, it was necessary to actually be in Jerusalem at that time, so we directed to be there. All right, so here we have the Feast of Passover. Now what does he do then? So what does, Ed, being a good uh, Jewish person, the Lord would have gone to Jerusalem. And when he got there, he went into the temple, and what did he see? Well, he saw the money changers again, and it says, those that sold oxen, verse 14, and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And he didn't say, excellent job, you are obviously uh, young entrepreneurs, and you are making money here. Well, what, what was the problem there? The problem there was they were making money off of the Lord's directive, and that was never to be the case. That is when people take advantage of the Lord's work, um, to, I say money, but it could be anything. And to take advantage of this, um, it, it, that doesn't please the Lord. This is what is called the era of the Nicolaitans, the supremacy of the um, religious elite over the laity. Okay, in other words, a lay person. So that, that is the era of the Nicolaitans in the book of Revelation. It talks about that. So who, do you remember the sons of Eli? I find upstanding Christian young men and uh, not. Okay, so these young ladies would be coming to the temple or to the tabernacle. The tabernacle wasn't. I knew that was wrong as soon as I said it. Then I thought, windows are wrong. Yes, the tabernacle. And what were they were taking advantage of them? Okay, so here they were coming to do the Lord's work. I guess maybe not all of them, but they were supposed to be. And they were taking advantage of these people. They would also take advantage of the sacrifices and take more than was meat for them. Take more meat than was meat for them. And so um, that, that was certainly frowned upon, okay? And it was considered a very wicked thing because here's an example of people taking advantage of the Lord's work and service for their own good. Well, that's what was happening here. And so the Lord wasn't happy about it. In verse 15, it says, When he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changer's money and overthrew the tables. Now, I don't know if you ever pictured that in your mind, but it almost sounds like, almost sounds like he's out of control. Almost. If somebody were to do that in our church service and overthrow the altar table and sling his stuff everywhere, <laughs> so, okay, you would probably think to yourself, what is that problem with that person? But the Bible says that the zeal of my, thine, uh, mine house, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, is what it says. So actually, this was a fulfillment of prophecy. 
<clears throat> and so he says, take these things hence and make not my father's house and house of merchandise. The truth of the matter is, if anybody has the right to um, do this, it would be the Lord himself. After all, this was, he says, his father's house. And uh, we have to understand that he made himself of no reputation. And, uh, but he and the father are one. So he has a right to do that. Okay, he has a right. To, it's not like it was a good thing to do and he should be praying. He has the right to do it. You understand the difference there? Okay. When, when somebody has a right to do something, there isn't really a discussion about it. Okay, he has a right to do it. Everybody accepts it. In order to accept somebody to have the right to do something, you have to accept their position. Is that true? Okay. If a person in another... Okay, let's say I thought you were, you were going too fast. And I went up beside you and I beat my home. I go, pull over, pull over right now. And I went behind you. And here's citizen's arrest, right? I'm, uh, uh, what's his name, Barney Fife. I go, citizen's arrest. And, and I, you were going too fast, sir. And you will slow down. Do you understand? What would you look at me like? Okay, like I have at least two heads, perhaps three. And so why? Well, who are you? What would you say? Who are you? Where's your badge? What right do you have to do this? I don't. Okay, so you would have a right to get. However, on the other hand, if I'm in this really nice car, which normally has a hopped up interceptor engine in it, and I've got the lights going and everything, and, and uh, I've got this official uniform, and I've got a gun over the side here, which is kind of, and, 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 I, and it's official, and then you say to yourself, okay, I'd better pull over. If you've got a shred of decency and civility in you, you're going to pull over, because this person has the right to do that. Why does he have the right to do that? Because he's a police officer. He has been given that right from the people who are, who are keeping these roads away. So, going to allow me to use those roads. So, um, <clears throat> we understand that. So, then the people that were upset with what the Lord did here, you know, notice that in this, all right, let's read through here. Um, and the disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou to us, seeing that thou do, doest these things? Then he says, uh, Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. All right, now probably Nicodemus, if he wasn't there, and he probably was, I feel, but at least he heard this. So let's not forget what we're talking about. Okay, so these events happened right before them. So he mentions that. Then said the Jews, 40 and six years was he in the temple building, wilt thou were these days? And the kind of the discussion went the other way. But what was, his, what was, his, what was their question? Did they say... You shouldn't do that. That's wrong what you did. To say that what these people are doing in this temple is absolutely perfectly right and you're wrong to do that. That's not what they, that's not what they did. They, they never questioned the fact that he did it. What did they question? Him, yeah. Whether he was positionally supposed to do it. That's, that's key to it. That is key. Because any of the, anybody really, but certainly in the, the Pharisees in this case, which I say Pharisees, is probably more the Sadducees because we know that they were in charge of the temple. Um, at this point, the temple, right? So, and I imagine out of the, all of the Jews, they would be the ones to allow this to happen. Yeah, so. exactly, right. So it was their directive. Probably they got kickbacks. And whatever reason, they knew it was wrong. They knew it was wrong. And, uh, and so, the, but they questioned his authority. So because they had the authority to say what goes or not in the temple, they thought it was their right to have those people there. Well, here comes the Lord, who the, the temple is made for, and who is in truth, which is in truth a symbolic of his own sacrifice, and he comes along and he overthrows these tables, well, what, what would our conclusion be? He has the right to do it. Now, whether we think it was done in too much of an aggressive manner or not, it really doesn't matter, does it? He has the right to do it. If the policeman stops you and, and he's, he yells, he goes, what's your problem, sir? You know you shouldn't be, or, or if they're real nice, whether they're nice or mean, it doesn't matter. They have the authority to do that. You follow? And, and it's not wrong. If you're wrong, you can't decide, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's the position there. If you're wrong, you can't decide what the person that's over you, uh, how, he, how, how they deal with it. So when you go into the courtroom and you stole from Jewel, and they go before, and, the, and it's evidence, they bring the evidence, everything is true and right, and the judge says, I, you're going to be three months in jail. Now you can't go and say, no, judge, I, I feel, and quite frankly, that that's a bit severe, and uh, maybe, I'll tell you what, Give me just a month. <laughs> what would they say? And you know what? No, I, I, that's too much to do. How about, how about two? Eh. All right, three days. I'll give you three days. A day for a month. How about that? You're going to strike up a deal, right? Why? Because you're wrong. The judge is right. If the judge at that point gives you whatever he gives you, 
It's up to him. So, um, so it all has to do with position. It all has to do with authority. It all has to do with whoever is there. How are they going to interpret the evidence? Whether or not they believe this is the, the Messiah or not. That's how they're going to interpret it. Just like if you come across fossils or whatever, how are you going to interpret that evidence? It depends on what you think about the worldview. Was it created or was it, did it evolve? That's going to completely color the way you look at that. What the Lord did here is going to be completely colored by whether or not people believe in this person. All right, so th these things happen. Nicodemus, don't forget, okay, he's watching these things. He's thinking about it. And so it says, then said the Jews, 40 and 60. Okay, then he talks about the temple. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. <clears throat> This is one of the passages where that is interpreted for us. And then said the Jews, 40 and 60 years was this temple in building. Now, what temple was that? Herod's. It was Herod's temple. So when they say 40 and 60 years, they're not talking since the day of Ezra, certainly, because that was a long time ago. Okay, so when they're saying 40 and 60 years, they're talking about Herod's temple and his uh, augment addition to the temple. Now we know that he built the fortress of Antonia. We know that he extended the temple mount. We know that he made it. So it, it was 46 years in him. So they're really referring to Herod's temple. But it says in verse 21, the interpretation, but he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which, which Jesus had said. And now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, uh, don't forget, that's, that's what's going on. In the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Okay, but, oh, sorry, verse 20. But, when, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. And he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. What does it mean, commit himself unto them? That means, I, I think, it means him becoming king at that time. It wasn't time. So, um... And, and he knew and understand, understood excuse me, what was going on. So he left it really up to the people to decide, is this the Messiah or is it not? Some people obviously did believe. The Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Jewish elite. Now we're in Judea. This is highbrow religious Judaism. And uh, they're interpreting all of these things as well. Nicodemus is also listening to these things. And it said he did many, many miracles in verse 23, right? Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. The Jews are looking for a sign. Why do they look for the sign? Because the Old Testament prophets spoke about signs. So the Jews, now it wasn't, it wasn't a bad, wrong thing. They were looking for the signs because that was Old fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. Okay, so... Um, now, let's talk a little bit more about what he said. This is by, still by way of introduction. <clears throat> the Old Testament fulfillment of the idea of the zeal of mine house hath eaten me up. This comes from Psalm 69.9. All right, so let's go back there and look at that. Actually, there's two scripture passages there. Uh, there it says, For the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, and for the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. That's interesting. He, the, the, only a portion of that verse was actually quoted. The other half, of course, is going to happen in, in, at this point in just a couple of years. Remember, this is, not, this is not the visit to the temple where he was crucified after this. This was... In a rich kid. This wasn't after his triumphal entry. That happened in a different one. It is through the book of John, by the way, that we know that this happened twice. So this is the initial one. The wedding at Canaan had just happened. And so it says, the latter part of that verse, the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. They were talking about his vicarious suffering on the cross. So it, it was at that very same temple. So, when, so we then see, then in the book of Psalms, a reference to that and, and a better understanding of it in the Lord's life. So Psalm 69, 9. And then, um, yeah, okay, so, so there we see he links it always with the Old Testament there. Um, now he then predicts his, uh, and we talked about that, let's talk a little bit more about his prediction of his resurrection. Um, it, it, the Jews then thought, what did they think when he said, when he said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up? And what would you think? You're sitting in the middle of the temple. I suppose if you were to take him literally, that you would think the same thing that the Jews did when they said, when they thought that he was referring to Herod's temple, 
Verse 21 interprets it for us that it was his body. It is interesting that these very words that he said would later be twisted to accuse him to the Roman government and put him to death. Uh, Matthew 26, 61. Okay, so verse 60, but found none, yea, though many false witnesses came, this is the trial of Christ, yet found they none, and at the last came two false witnesses, and who do these, what, what do these witnesses say? This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? And what is it to which these witness against thee? So they used it against him, misunderstanding completely, apparently, all the way up until the time that he died, it was probably reported among the Jews that he had said that he was going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, speaking of that very temple, which, of course, Herod, being the tetrarch in the area, would have been an affront to Herod directly to have destroyed that temple, right? Or even to say that he could build it in three days when it took Herod 46. We understand that kings back then were absolutely full of pride, and if you, if you, so especially that one. At any rate, um, this is, we can clearly see what the Jews are trying to do. So they were accusing the Lord of the very same thing. Now, they should have known that there was a difference here. And this is where a language study. Um, so let me, let me put in a little plug for language study again. The, uh, hopefully you see at this point that uh, knowing and understanding uh, these things in the original language, is a, is a, it helps a lot. But it says here... Um, when it says, then said the Jews, 40 and 60 years was this temple and building, that, that word temple, and wilt thou rear, rear it up in, in three days. Uh, so we know that um, he was referring to not the same thing. And in English, the word temple is used both times. So in verse um, 20, and actually 19 and 20, it says, then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple, that word temple and building. And then verse 21, but he spake of the temple of his body. All right, those are two different words. All right, uh, the first one is, uh, it's actually Hiran, which is, English, is, is pronounced like that, Hiran. The other one is Neos, which is just simply, ne, I guess like that, Neos. It does pretty similar. Okay, so these are two different uh, words. This is talking about the entire, entire temple area. Yeah, so this is referring to the, uh, the, maybe the entire temple mount. See, to really understand what's going on here, we have to understand the words that they use, but then we also have to understand that when, we're, when, you're, when you talk about the temple, it's a big, huge area. You, we, we, when you, it's not just the building, it's, it's a big area. And when we were in Jerusalem, I remember walking around on the Temple Mount, and you can see the place where the temple was, but the mount itself was much, much larger. And so this is the entire Temple Mount. Well, this is the temple proper. This in Greek refers to the temple proper. So when the Jews there used the word temple, they were talking about the entire Temple Mount, and when the Lord used it, or when the interpretation is given there, it says the temple of his body, it uses a different word. Okay? And that's more of the temple itself, the very building. So, it should have been understood uh, that there was, a, uh, there was a difference there. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's see, in Luke, here we're right here. Let's go just one page over, maybe. Luke 24, 8. Uh, so this resurrection was remembered, of course. They remembered his words. This said that he would, on the third day, he would raise again. Look at verse 7. Or so here the Lord appears on the two men on the road to Emmaus. In Luke 24, 6, it says, He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, Okay, yeah, okay, so saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sin. So he didn't, it doesn't say that he said this in Galilee, it says that he spoke some other things in Galilee, but then this same one who spoke them before in Galilee said, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. 
and they remembered his words. When did he say those words? When he was in the temple. So they remembered this. And so when, uh, undoubtedly, why, why did these crowds, if you'll excuse the term, flock to him? Okay, Because he was... All right, so you can imagine a story. Now, let's go back to understanding the Passover briefly. Um, so in this introduction, which it's good to, to, to know about the Passover. It's good to understand what the relationship between the Jews were. It's good to, to put all those things here in the introduction because it helps us when, when we come to Nicodemus. Um, so it was during the Passover time, many Jews were in Jerusalem that were not Judean Jews. They were from other places. But they were there because of the feast today. And so a lot of them there were, it's kind, it was kind of like a vacation time. So they had more time. Okay, they didn't have to go to work the next day. You see what I'm saying? They could spend their time around the Temple Mount, and they undoubtedly prepared for this time all the way through the year. And so they had time to discuss things. They had time to observe things. They had time to just kind of hang around. In the, you can, it's kind of a festive, almost temp, um, feast kind of spirit. And so when somebody comes into the Temple who is not unfamiliar, really, I suppose, in some regions, at this point he, his ministry hadn't really, wasn't super popular. But you can imagine that word spread pretty quickly that there's somebody that came into the temple and overthrew the money changers and all this and chased them. I said, small cores. So he was whipping them. Get out of here. Um, and so that probably went all over the place. And so it ca- a problem, un- undoubtedly caused many people to want in the days uh, subsequently to go to the temple and to see what else was going on there. So the Lord, all these people came there and he taught them. And he showed them miracles. Undoubtedly he healed people. And so many believed on him. <clears throat> the Sadducees are watching this and seeing all of their would-be people that they are controlling, uh, leaving them and going to uh, the Lord. Well, they didn't like that very much. So, um, anyway, so that, that's kind of the introduction. All right, let's move back then a little bit. Um, All right, now let's look, talk a little bit more about Nicodemus himself. So now that we've introduced those things, we'll talk about him. We'll talk about the man Nicodemus. All right, so two. We'll talk, say there's Nicodemus in Christ. All right, so this man Nicodemus hears all of these things, and he's a, he's a Pharisee. By the, word, by the way, the word Nicodemus means victor over the people. So his name means victor over the people. His family is really unknown. Uh, many believe that he may be <coughs> the brother of Josephus, the historian. His, he had a brother named Nicodemus ben Gorion. And so because we don't have a genealogy of Nicodemus, many people believe, and because he could have lived during that same time, many believe that this is Josephus' brother. He was a member of the Sanhedrin, and he was one of the richest men in Jerusalem. Now, what we b- believe and know about Nicodemus after this time, that apparently he died a pauper. Apparently he was a very poor man when he died. Although he had been one of the most rich. And so a lot of people conjecture maybe that this was because of the... Um, the persecution, having accepted Christ and having maybe taken a stand. A lot of people think that Nicodemus was, is representative of this weak kind of, you know, I'm going to be a Christian, but from afar. And maybe initially that was the case, but apparently if this is the same Nicodemus, he must have been pretty outspoken about it after that time and even suffered some persecution if indeed he did die a poor man. So it says in John 3, 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. So from this we get he was a Pharisee, but he was also a member of the Sanhedrin. And so it um, is, so then he has an interview with the Lord. And why, why did he do this? Well, it tells us right here, The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. All right, so what is Nicodemus thinking? He's looking at the same evidence that everybody else is. And he's coming to, uh, some, some people would have the same conclusion he did, but certainly not too many among the Pharisees. Why did he come to that conclusion? 
How did he convince himself in his mind that the Lord would have been who he said he was, or certainly had come from God? What was his conclusion? Why did he conclude that? It says, tells us right there. Yeah, his miracles performed. We, said, we know that, I think it was in verse 23 of the previous chapter, that he did all of these miracles. So because of those miracles that he performed, Nicodemus is simply looking at the evidence and trying to decide for himself, okay, is this man come from God or not? And he might think to himself, well, you know, he overturned the money changers, but at the same time, he's doing all these miracles. And Okay, he did do this, but... And really couldn't get over the fact that he's performing all these miracles and doing it always to help people. So it was that, and, and is, that a, is that a natural conclusion? Would that be linked with Old Testament prophecy? It is, okay? It tells us of uh, who would do great, great and, and mighty miracles and the mighty God and, and that, that the Messiah was going to be a person of might and he was going to be a person, a miracle-working person. So Nicodemus then was able to link this. So he, would, he could say... Because of the miracles you're doing, you must come from God. He, he knows that because of the Old Testament. He can links it with the Old Testament. All right, so he's, he invites him over, apparently. And Jesus then answered and said unto him, remember it said that um, in verse 25 of chapter 2, what did it say there? Needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. That is actually an introduction to the discourse of Nicodemus because I think what was in man is talking about this man, Nicodemus, right here. We have to remember that in the original text, there isn't a chapter break. Okay? It goes from one to another. Okay? Sometimes it's good to get rid of those chapter breaks so you can see things better. So there's a man of the Pharisees then. So anyway, so he knew what was in man. He knew what was in Nicodemus. He knew his thoughts. He knew what he, you know, he, um, his, yeah, his thoughts. So, Nicodemus opens the conversation, giving a, a word of, uh, of belief, and, and, but maybe still, um, oh, he lacked some things. Now, what is interesting, we'll get to this in just a second, is that, in just a second, is that his thoughts were correct. What he lacked, actually, was Bible knowledge. Interestingly enough, <laughs> Nicodemus was a, a doctor of the law. But the Lord uses an Old Testament, uh, part of the history of the Old Testament, to, to help them understand who he was. Well, Nicodemus never made that connection before. So what was he lacking? He was lacking Bible knowledge, interestingly enough. Okay? It wasn't that, that was what he was lacking. So he opens the conversation by an announcement of his belief in Christ's divine mission, that it must be true because of his works. <clears throat> And then, um, so let's go on here. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Notice the inflection in the Lord's words here that is totally and completely conditional, isn't it? Except. We sometimes use the word, use the word if. That's true if and only if. Sometimes we say that right to, for emphasis. That's true if and only if. Right? This is kind of the same, same thing. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man, if and only if, a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So this is a all-inclusive, without exception, condition. And he goes on to reaffirm this when he uses the word must. Nicodemus say that in him, how can a man be born? He is old. Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Or like a very logical question. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and the spirit. He cannot. Notice the word cannot. Except a man cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, notice the authority there. Do not marvel that I am saying to you, you must, be, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell where it cometh and whither it goes. So is everyone that is born of the spirit. So he's, he's mentioning that what he's talking about is intangible things, not tangible like being born. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest now thou these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that which we do know. Notice what he's saying here. You lack knowledge, Nicodemus. That's your problem. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. 
Please tell me, in all of your vast Bible knowledge, why we have a change in person there. We have the first person plural, we, and then it has the second person plural, ye. Do you see that? Let, let me highlight them. I'll do that with an inflection in my voice. I think you'll understand. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak not that we do know and testify that we have seen and ye receive not our witness. So there's a change there, isn't it? It's first person plural, which includes the Lord and apparently somebody else, because it's plural. And then he direct ye is second person. He's directing it to somebody else and more than one person. Okay, so explain to me why that is. We're, we're, I, I want to delve deep into your knowledge because I am lacking. I am dry. Could it be at this point Jesus um, is referring to the Godhead? Could very well be. That could be. It's a good point. Speaking of frustration. Well, that's certainly true, yeah. It's reference to the Holy Spirit who talks in verse 8 about the wind blowing where it listed today. Yeah. I know that. So we... That's symbolic of the Holy Spirit. So yes. Well, he says it right there, born of the Spirit. So that goes back to what Jacob said about the Trinity. So could we conclude here that when he says we, that he's dealing with all the members of the Godhead, and he's linking himself here with God the Father, and, and in which case then, he's speaking of his own deity here? And then the ye could be, he's referring to not just Nicodemus, but the Jewish people yeah. as a whole. Yes. So you see that verse there, understanding the person there is very, very important. By the way, he reaffirms this when he says the Son of Man which is in heaven. So he reaffirms his omnipresence. So here in verse 11, he's linking himself with the Trinity. So he's affirming to Nicodemus his deity. And then later on he says, um, when he talks about his omnipresence, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, present tense. So this grammatical structure is very important to understand. And I think it's brought out just fine in English. As everything is, really. I mean, it's brought out. Okay, so how then, so what must Nicodemus have been thinking? I don't know, is he speaking Hebrew here, actually? But it's, it's given, to, now let's think about what's happening here, too. This is a Jew. I think that likely the Lord and Nicodemus are having a discussion in Hebrew. However, when it was recorded for us, it was recorded in Greek. And now we have it translated into English in lots of different languages. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? So, when, it was, so when, the, when, the, when the Lord said, if I go, the Holy Spirit will not come, and then he's going to show you all things which, whatsoever I have told you, apparently this, this Hebrew discussion was given by the Holy Spirit again in Greek, apparently, and it was recorded for us that way. All I'm saying by saying that is that the Hebrew and Greek words are inflected, so therefore they don't necessarily use pronouns. It's understood in the word itself. You, if you know anything about different languages, you know that that's not uncommon in different languages, that just to change the form of the verb, which would include the person and number there. So that's what's happening here. So a lot of different things are going on, but he says ye. All right, so he's trying to get Nicodemus to see these what I'm telling you is, are, are not physical things. When he says being born again, he's not talking about physical things. He's talking about, he's talking about spiritual things. Then he goes on to, to reaffirm that he is, he is God himself. So it's kind of like, all right, Nicodemus, here's what it is. You're either going to accept it or you're not. But the person standing here is uh, it's, it's the Trinity. It's, it's that, the Spirit. Then he says, we, linking with the Spirit, like Dustin said. Very good point. And then it said, our witness. Okay, who else could that be, by the way, when it says our witness, who else could he be referring to? Who else witnessed and testified of Christ? The disciples, the disciples but in particular before them. John the Baptist, yeah. So that's certainly a witness there. Yeah, yes, in the prophets, I mean, it's all that. But uh, when it, if it's the same we, our, then it's talking about the Trinity. Um, and it's talking about speaking and knowing and seeing. All right, so... To speak, to know, and to see, and to be a witness. Is that going to hold up in court? If you've got, you bring someone in here that, that knows what's going on, had heard it, and saw it, that's pretty good, isn't it? Then the ye, you've got to do what you want to with it, but we have definite, solid testimony of it. All right, so I think the person there is important. <clears throat> 
Um, now it's interesting too that later on, understanding what happens with Nicodemus here, Nicodemus later on is actually the one that defended the Lord when they when they when were when they were accusing him initially. Nicodemus said that uh, not 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 his crucifixion, but that when they were accusing him when he was in a, another time in, in in Jerusalem, and he said, "Doesn't our law make?" say that you have to have more than one witness and that sort of thing. So he ends up defending the Lord at that time, and he takes a step. Now, many people, again, would accuse Nicodemus for not being strong enough, but I will say this, he certainly did it. He certainly stood up and said something, which I don't think we can understand how difficult really that was. The, the religious pressure put on a Jewish person, especially back then, and even today for Orthodox Jews, is extremely, it's, it's very, very, that's a lot. And it's not only in, Ju in Judaism. Catholics do that, too, and lots of different people. All right, so he defends the Lord later on. Also, in the burial of the Lord, we see that Nicodemus, so we're talking about times where Nicodemus, um, we see him after this time. Then he is involved in his burial. And he, maybe he was encouraged by the example of Joseph of Arimathea, maybe. Um, he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes and that sort of thing. So it was something very uh, expensive. That's how we know that probably he was a very rich man. So he was there. He was willing to, to give a little bit for, for the Lord's burial there. So what kind of character do you suppose Nicodemus, after looking at these things, what kind of character does this man have? And this won't be a very long discussion, but just really quick. Do you think that he should have been stronger in his stand? Do you think that he should have, uh, what do you think he should have done? Do you think he should have broken completely away from the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and everything and joined the disciples and been there in the upper room? Maybe he was. I think he probably was. Do you, is, would it be possible to have still been a Pharisee and, and, and a member of the Sanhedrin and be a saved man? Maybe try to help them? Let's make it practical. I and mean, this is real people we're talking about, real events, real jobs, real positions. It happened. What kind of position? What should he have done? Well, it's impossible to say God's will. Can I understand that? But maybe you've heard preaching and teaching before that Nicodemus is this big wimp, you know, spiritually and all that sort of thing. Maybe. Maybe so. But maybe he just felt like the Lord would still have him there to try to help some of the other Pharisees. You know, we don't know. At any rate, nothing necessarily bad is said about, directly about Nicodemus this way. So, um, now, what about the fact of him coming to Jesus by night? Okay, what about that? So we're still talking about uh, Nicodemus and Christ. He comes to uh, the Lord by night. What, what do a lot of people say? Well, he did that because it's because he wanted anybody to know, as if it was a secret thing. But in John chapter 3, uh, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, now what does that mean? It means that he went there at nighttime. Okay? What, are, what is the conclusion sometimes? Well, he didn't want to do it in the daytime in front of everybody because he was sneaking around. Is that necessarily brought out in the scriptures here? I think that's kind of added there. Maybe his duties required him to be elsewhere in the daytime. It was dinner time, we know that, I would think. Actually, doesn't say that either, does it? So I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I, I'm not saying that it's not so, but I'm saying it's maybe not a definitive thing necessarily. Okay, that's just like people color Jacob, like Jacob and Esau, as this big wimp at home kind of thing, and Esau is the mighty hunter out there. Okay, well, you know, Jacob was, he, he did all of those things. He kept uh, all of the flocks and all of that. So I don't think he was necessarily a wimpy person. Anyway, we have to be careful about coloring these characters to, to try to say something that maybe it doesn't. Okay, so this person, although he was a ruler and a religious teacher, let's talk about uh, Nicodemus' um, uh, and, and, and the Lord's, um, oh, their discussion. All right, so let's talk about a little bit more about their discussion, and then we'll finish with this. Uh, I guess you could just say the discussion. Okay. So it came to the Lord by night. We talked about that. So this... Okay, so first, 
the first thing underneath the discussion we'll, we'll look at is uh, this idea of needing a new birth. So he said before, this man was a ruler and a religious teacher, but that didn't help him get any closer to heaven than anything else. Not, not one nanomillimeter closer to heaven. I don't know if that's a measurement, but there you have it. Matthew Henry says something uh, interesting. And I notice what the Lord says, Art thou a master in Israel, and knowest thou not these things? Um, where is that at? How come I cannot? Uh, ten? Yes. Yeah. I'm sure that if I wasn't standing in front of you and sitting where you are, I would have found that immediately. <laughs> It's kind of like being a math teacher. I can't work anything out on the board, but if I'm sitting there, I can do anything I want to. Yes, 10. Jesus answered and said to them, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? A rhetorical question, to be sure, right? He's actually making a statement there. So this got him no closer than anything else. Matthew Henry says this, No stronger expression could have been chosen to signify a great and most remarkable change of state and character. We must be entirely different from what we were before as that which begins to be at any time is not and cannot be the same with that which was before. So being saved, uh, whether, whether somebody is saved out of, a, out of a horrible past or whether somebody is saved and they're the CEO of Lamborghini. That guy's name is Winkleman, by the way. <laughs> so um, whether that's the case, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not going to go there. So whether that was the case uh, or not, the point is that uh, they have to change. They've got to go as much of a radical change as anybody else. There has to be a difference. They who are in Christ are a new creature. Old things are passed away, all things have become new. It doesn't say those who are in Christ that came from a horrible background are a new creature. No, it says everybody. The, think, the, or the thoughts, excuse me, all of us. So, so a fine, upstanding citizen of the world has to go through as much of a change as anybody else. So it requires a new birth. And so the Lord was trying to help Nicodemus by helping him to see that although he's a master in Israel, he has to go through a change. It has to be a, a regeneration. It has to be a, a, an, an understanding that he doesn't have. Then secondly, let's talk about this reference to Moses and the serpent. So now... Um, Let's go to verse 12. Let me just read through these verses so I'm sure to come to the one I'm looking for. <laughs> if I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven, though there we linked with his omnipresence. And as Moses... Okay, now here it is. Now here's the... You're a master of Israel, you don't understand these things. Let me use an Old Testament story here to help you out, Nicodemus. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so... Even so, must the Son of Man be lifted up. As much as it was necessary for Nicodemus to be born again, it was just as necessary for the Son of Man to be lifted up. Does that say must? That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So these are the things that lead up to John 3.16. No need to read that again. Well, there probably is a need, but we'll get there. So... He's talking about Moses and the brazen serpent. So what happened there? This is in Numbers 21, 6 through 9. We won't read the passage, and I'll just mention it. I think you remember what happened was that the people murmured. Again, again, murmur, murmur, murmur. That word, you just have to say it a bunch of times, and you're already doing what it says. Murmur, 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 murmur. Okay. So they murmured that, they, that the Lord brought them out there. They didn't give them what they need, food, water, all the rest of their complaining, their baby in, their belly aching, call it whatever you want to. Okay. Well... They had it, okay? And then when it, whenever that happens, they're actually blaming the Lord, but they end up blaming the representative of the Lord, which is Moses. There's a lot I could say there. But so then Moses goes to the Lord and says, what do I do? And so the Lord said, I want you to make a pole and make a brazen serpent. I, always thought, I often thought to myself, you know, it would take a while to do that. It's not like you can just go to Dollar General and pick one up. They, actually, they had to have bronze. They had to melt it. They had to form it into the serpent. They had to stick it on a pole. They had to get the pole somewhere. I mean, just to manufacture this thing that, that he was talking about would take time. And lift it up. So, stick it up in the air. 
who, the idea was whoever looks to it, the, the, the scriptures say whoever looks to that will be cured. Oh, by the way, there were sna snakes. And so the Lord sent snakes among the people because they complained and they were apparently quite venomous. I remember when we were in, uh, when we were in Okinawa, uh, was it Okinawa? Yeah. And uh, they had snakes there called habus. And they weren't very big, but they were pretty nasty little critters. And they were little and they were really fast. And one of them was the golden habu, and that was particularly venomous. And so we were going through the jungles and all that, and there's these habus. They're, they're there. And so it kind of gives you the creeps. You're like, what in the world? Well, this guy, he was an M60, he was a machine gunner, and he was in front of me. And he, we're, we're going through a patrol, and then the patrol leader would, would go like this, which means stop. Okay, then, then he would go off into the side, and that would signal everybody else to kind of go off into the side. So we did that, and this, mach <laughs> this machine gunner is in front of me, and all of a sudden, I, he tears out of there. <laughs> He's, ah, he freaks out. Well, it turns out, he looked down, he was holding his M60. He looked down, and a habu was crawling all over his M60 there. <laughs> Not a good idea. We would have all been killed. Anyway, um, I'd like to tell you that he, a fellow Marine, was staunch in his desire, and he allowed the hapu to crawl over him. He maintained his bearing, but he didn't. <laughs> he absolutely did not. <laughs> absolutely did not. <laughs> By the way, we put our uh, bivouac site uh, at times on a tarantula hill. Wake you up in the morning, Sarah, with tarantulas on me. I'm not kidding you. Oh, yeah. Right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, Bethany, it was there. I mean it. It was right on top of those big furry, hairy things. Oh, man. <laughs> Creepy. Which we found out that they're actually pretty docile animals. <laughs> we caught a field mouse one time. We thought it'd be really neat to get the tarantula to eat the field mouse or whatever was going to do to it. So we, we put this field mouse down like that and we tied the string on the tarantula and we put him right on top of that field mouse. He did nothing to it. <laughs> Things aren't that big of a deal. Who cares? So serpents were sent, and they were biting people, and they were terribly venomous, apparently. And people were dying. So they, the same people, the person they complained to, it's funny, when this was happening, they went back to Moses again, and they said, help. <laughs> Moses, you brought us out, what's your problem? You're getting, help. Fickle. So they were punishing rebellious Israel, and he said, put this brazen serpent above. So he was trying to get them to see things. Undoubtedly, Nicodemus had taught this before. Undoubtedly. He was a master of Israel. He's a doctor of the law. He taught this thing before, but he didn't understand the significance of it. And later on, as it were, so what's, what's the idea there? A brass, excuse me, is a picture of judgment. The snake is a picture of sin. We know that from Genesis chapter 3. So um, what is the idea there? We know this is a picture of Christ. It has to be being raised up like that. It's a picture of himself. Why a snake and why brass? Because he was made sin for us and he was punished of the Lord for that sin. So it's, it's a complete picture of the gospel right there. And so what the Lord is really saying is, Nicodemus, if you were there, would you look up to the brass serpent or would you not? So he goes on to say, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must son of man be lifted up. So whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So he gives us the interpretation of looking to is actually believing. For God so loved the world, and so forth, he sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. Very, very, very strict, definite verses here. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world. So he's giving a picture of himself to Nicodemus, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Why do the Pharisees not believe it? Because their deeds are evil. It has nothing to do with their lack of mental capacity to accept the gospel. It has nothing to do with that. It's because their deeds are evil. Why, when he overturned the tables, did they question his authority? Because their deeds were evil. Light was there. Their deeds were evil, so they didn't accept it. By the way, this same pole and the brazen serpent on top of it, according to 2 Kings 18.4, began to be worshipped by the nation of Israel, so they had to destroy it, interestingly enough. <clears throat> okay. Um, and then, all right, so then let's talk about being born of water and spirit here. Just so we've got a couple more minutes. Um, by the way, Nic Nicodemus's 
Yeah, Nicodemus' acceptance of the Lord was based on empirical evidence. Well, what do I mean by that? What does empirical mean? Logic. What's that? Logic and uh, reasoning. Okay, reasoning, but it's, um, it's, it's evidence outside of the Scripture. In other words, empirical evidence is, is uh, like experimental evidence, okay? I can see it. I've tested it, I've experimented for it, so I can see it, therefore I accept it as truth. It's scientific, as it were. Is everything that we believe and accept about the scriptures to be empirical, or is it to be because it's in the Bible? Are we supposed to test these things before we believe them? Are we supposed to experiment and, and do all these things before, we, or just accept it because it's in the scriptures? Yeah, and that is primary. So we accept it because it's in the Bible. That is primary evidence. Priori, if you want to use the Latin term, evidence. Nicodemus wasn't accepting. Now, could he have accepted the person of Christ linking it with the Old Testament? He could have. The Lord did that. But his acceptance of perhaps this being the Messiah was not based on that evidence. It was based on empirical evidence. You see the, the difference there? So what the Lord was saying is that that only goes so far. You have to accept it because the scriptures say of these things. And he consistently did that. So for us to simply accept something because the Bible says it, whether we can prove it or not, is to the world foolishness, but it is to God faith and it pleases him. So what of this idea of being born of the water and the spirit? Well, let me give you four views that have been offered as to what this means. Some of these are kind of humorous. Number one is... People talk about, as you, well, let me look, let's look at what Matthew Henry says about this. There's another thing I think is pretty interesting. Thus, the things of the Spirit of God are foolishness unto the natural man. Many think there can be no proof of anything they cannot believe. Christ's discourse of gospel truths shows the folly of those who make these things strange unto them, and it recommends us to search them out. Jesus Christ is every way able to reveal the will of God to us, for he came down from heaven and yet is in heaven. <clears throat> that has to be accepted by faith. What Matthew Henry is really saying in a paraphrastic sort of way is that faith is what pleases God. Paraphrastic means roundabout way. So um, now, what are the four main views? Some people think this is baptismal regeneration. At being born of the water, now that was us what a Pentecostal person would say. Your um, charismatic churches would say, this is talking about baptismal generation. There you go. The Lord himself, that born of the water, is talking about baptismal regeneration. Well, if we're going to interpret John chapter 3 to be that way, that flies in the face of a lot of scripture. Okay? By the way, uh, when he's talking about being born again there, it's, um, it's a spiritual thing, isn't it? It's not a physical... Um, in fact, the very thing that the Lord is making a distinction of here is a, something physical and something spiritual. Well, baptism in the water is something physical, isn't it? And he's saying here it's something spiritual. So to interpret this thing back to something physical when the Lord's point was to make it something spiritual is error. So he's not talking about that, but some people would offer, uh, offer that. Okay, and by the way, a, a, a succumbing to baptism is, could be considered a work. And we know that salvation is not by works. And clearly the Lord is talking about salvation here because he's talking about going to heaven. So there's lots of reasons why it can't be baptism, baptismal regeneration. Now, other people say it's referring to, of course, physical birth. And that this view, view excuse me, uh, is clarified, I believe, in verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is the flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So those that hold this view would say the re Lord reaffirms what he's talking about after Nicodemus's question in verse 6, which I think that that's certainly the case. Thirdly, people believe this talking about John's baptism of repentance in the Jordan, which the Pharisees had rejected. Once again, they take the, the angle of baptism, right? whether it's uh, just... Ecclesi ecclesiastical baptism, which is actually John's baptism too. But those people would separate it because they're universal church people. Okay? So keep in mind and bear in mind that when people try to incorporate, incorporate baptism in this is because they believe in a, a universal church theory. They believe that first and then they try to make the scriptures uh, uh, combined to that for the most part. 
And that's why there, there's not a lot out there, really, that has that kind of uh, conservative viewpoint on the scriptures, that the, the church is local church. And so any kind of baptism is simply an individual's believer, and the church's duty to do so, but it's individual. There's no baptism into a universal church. Okay, then, and then fourth, fourthly, a lot of people believe they're simply talking about the Word of God. Because many times in the scripture, the Word of God is, is thought of as water. Then also the Spirit of God. The, the, the Word of God and the Spirit of God, Ephesians chapter 6, in the sword of the Spirit, which is uh, the Word of God. And so the, this idea is that, that which the Spirit uses is what it's talking about, water. Um, so is that what the Lord is talking about? Is he talking about the, the spiritual thing, the Bible? Talking about that kind of, I don't know, I suppose that could be. But I tend to lean towards, he's simply making a distinction between the physical and the spiritual. And I think he bears that out with the rest of his explanation here. So did, the, did Nicodemus accept Christ? Did he? <clears throat> I would think by, let's see, as Moses lifted up, yeah, I, I would think he is. Um, based on some of the things I said before. Now, one more quick thing. When the Lord here is saying, um, yeah, so when it says here, and no man hath ascended up into heaven, but he that came down from heaven, no man has ascended up into heaven. Now, where would that be a problem, maybe? Was that Elijah speaking? He went up to heaven. <laughs> he, he said, so... What, is he excluding Elijah here? Um, so I think it's that the Lord here is referring to the third heaven of 2 Corinthians 12, 2. Well, the heaven Elijah was taken to apparently was the heaven that where captivity was led captive after the first roots of the resurrection. There's a lot of theology there, and I just laid it out for you in just a couple of seconds, but that's, there's a lot to that, okay? Um, but the explanation here is that there's, there's when, when the word heaven is used, um, it's, it's, it, uranu in Greek, it's also, and it's also shamayim in Hebrew, but it's always plural in Hebrew, always. That, that word heaven never exists as heaven in Hebrew, it's always heavens. So apparently there's more than one, I think here we're talking about a distinction between the heavens. <clears throat> 